The first thing is that people think that uh, syntax should be represented somehow in terms of trees, and that operations should apply to these trees starting with the smaller domains and going into bigger ones, sort of bottom-up derivations. And of course, every point is can be questionable, but the, that's the, you know something that I have in common with the other people here. That's the tradition I come out of. And lately, or lately, I don't know, for quite a while now, people have been increasingly concerned with the difference between two kinds of morphemes, which we're roughly calling roots, and I guess you could call the other ones not roots, but I might call them also grammatical or functional categories, as it says in the first uh, bullet point. And what people today call roots uh, have been identified in the past with what a lot of people have called lexical categories, but I don't think the dichotomy is exactly uh, making it that dichotomy that it's just different terms for the same thing is misleading. Uh, however, I do think there's quite a sharp division. It's not any kind of continuum. I'm always against this kind of notion of continuum in formal linguistics. Okay, people use the term continuum, that means they've never taken any math, that they're not continuums. I mean, a continuous function is a totally different thing. But uh, you might say that some other more accurate words are things like lines or whatever that have uh, uh, slow, uh, I mean, a point, sort of step-by-step -step differentiation between uh, category A until you get to category B with sort of one thing at a time changing each way along the line. But I don't think the difference between, shall we call them, roots and grammatical categories or root morphemes and grammatical uh, grammatical category morphemes uh, is a, a continuum or a cline or anything is quite sharp. Uh, one thing is it's not marked in, at least it's not marked with a two-way implication in the pronunciation. Okay, there are certain things that you can tell from their pronunciation, as I will say, that are roots, but uh, grammatical Morphemes are pronounced in ways that lots of roots are pronounced, and I gave some pairs there. So you can see there's a lot of uh, identical pairs, one of which is a root and one of which isn't. That's in one. So uh, since syntax has been, <coughs> the history of syntax, and formal syntax in particular, has been mainly concerned with, uh, not with you know, the indi individual members of open class categories. I mean, you don't have, you know, well-known syntactic <coughs> studies that discuss the difference between, say, uh, harm and damage, or you know, some great article by Chomsky discuss the difference between uh, persuade and convince in terms of semantics. I mean, uh, you of course there is always people writing about everything, but uh, that's most of formal grammatical syntax or morphal syntax has had to do with. Um, uh, what we call grammatical morphemes. And uh, the thing is, quite a bit is known about these, actually, more than many articles give the impression. One is that, well, uh, besides the lexical categories, uh, the open class lexical categories, which have many, many members <coughs> coming back to that, and which have something to do with roots, which are nouns, verbs, adjectives, and possibly P, meaning preposition slash Position. Uh, there are these other categories, and some people would say they're to be subdivided in many ways, but uh, I would say those subdivisions are not so syntactically justified, but that's a, not one of my main points. But there's certainly a difference between uh, grammatical categories that modify nouns, uh, let's call them determiners, and uh, they can be sometimes uh, free morphemes that, uh, that appear with noun phrases, as in 2A. Or one uh, step forward, I think, adhered to by lots of people in 1968, pronouns are determiners by Paul Polson. Okay, so what, what are pronouns in traditional grammar? Well, they're uh, these determiners that happen to have a null or possibly absent noun phrase sister. But basically, the difference between these boys and these is, is not in the category of these. These is a D or a determiner that has a plural irregular or let's say idiosyncratic plural form 
And it can, it may or may not be followed by an alphabet, like those boys from Chicago and those boys or those. Okay, so that's a 2A and 2B. There's another grammatical category about the modifiers of verbs, very much part of a formal grammar, very much part of the Chomskyan tradition that says that these are not just uh, a kind of a slowly, uh, you know, many verbs are regular, but then there's a few that are irregular, and then a few that are a little bit more irregular, and a few that are hardly recognizable as verbs, but they're still verbs because it's kind of a kind in me. I don't believe in any of that. I think it's just uh, obscure things. What you have is a very clear distinction between what a lot of people think of as verbs and uh, something like uh, I, or in some places T, or uh, and they include, uh, first of all, uh, as in three, they include modals, uh, the ones that don't have agreement, and they also include some other things that act syntactically like modals, which are in 3B, and they're often called auxiliaries. Um, so the things in I are distinct from the things in B, categorically distinct, and they're distinct in trees. Now, you start to notice that these, here's two, two big categories of grammatical morphemes, I, and uh, some people say T, B, a T, I, and D. And well, uh, there's more morphemes in these categories than uh, a lot of people might think, partly because a lot of grammatical studies and a lot of grammatical students uh, kind of fixate on the first thing that comes to their mind. Oh, the. Yeah, there's a determiner called the. Are there any other determiners? Uh, 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 a demonstrative is of that. Um, indefinite article. Okay. But no, there's more than 20. Okay. And they were laid out quite clearly by Jack and Doff in his 1977 book, X Bar Syntax. Okay. In the chapter on specifiers and nouns. And uh, the verb, the, um, the auxiliaries, I's, T's, that have what uh, many syntacticians call nowadays the nice properties uh, appearing before n apostrophe t and inversion and yes no questions i etc. Uh, the things in three are the things that have the nice properties. Okay, <coughs> nothing that's a verb has the nice properties. Nothing that has the nice properties is a verb. Think we need another symbol. I'll call it i. Okay. Um, then there are some other grammatical categories. Uh, that are also of a limit, that have a limited number of members. Among other things, you can't coin them. Okay, I can't make up a new determiner. Okay, and I can't make up a new numeral. Okay, um, that counting and addition and arithmetic is not part of the language faculty. You all know little kids that might say something like, Oh, I got a billion, thousand, two hundred, five hundred zillion of these toy soldiers. Okay. Uh, well, was that arithmetically well formed? Well, it's irrelevant, right? Uh, but nonetheless, it was syntactically well formed. Okay. A billion, thousand, two hundred million, a zillion, and seven of these. Okay. Uh, and uh, there is a professor at Edinburgh that studied a lot of these more about them, Herford. So, interestingly, when you get these closed classes, and they are closed, that means no pointing, and in fact, if you look, if you try to put them all together from, say, a language like English, uh, basically, you know, you could argue about some innovation, but, you know, you find between 20 and 30 uh, of a maximum, even if you put together, and you might say, well, there's different kinds of determiners, you shouldn't lump them together. But okay, if you do lump them together, they still come out less than 30. Okay, and by dividing them up in different ways, you don't get a different total number. So there's a whole bunch of these categories that have somehow between 20 and 30 elements, and they they play a central role in grammar, right? Uh, and then I've got down here the degree modifiers for uh, for adjectives or uh, grading modifiers. Okay. There's one on there that you might not recognize, hella, at the end of the line. And my kid, when he was about five, uh, he and all his friends said hella. And where did they say it? Exactly where people say very. Okay, of course it was coined, but it was coined by five-year-olds 
in Berkeley, California, that's a cool place. I mean, five-year-olds in Berkeley. That's <laughs> the world. Okay? Um, so, uh, they, I think they don't say that anymore. Actually, I think it died out already, to tell you the truth. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's hella important. She's hella stupid. Uh, uh, he's got, uh, I got, he's got a hella big house. Okay. Um, so, uh, it was a grading adjective for 20 years ago. This way going. Okay. And again, you have uh, between 20 and 30 of these closed class items. Uh, now, one place where I would say I differed in my work in the, uh, I don't know, 2005 from a lot of people, but I think that other people are kind of going along with this now, and, uh, maybe not even realizing that I said it, but I did. Uh, and that is, uh, among the nouns, words, adjectives, and peas, uh, there's a subset of nouns that deserve to be called grammatical nouns. And a subset, and there's a list, and there might be a couple more nouns. And there's a subset of B's, and also a subset of A's, and a subset of P's that deserve to be called grammatical. Now, what does that mean then? Because in fact, at first the idea was these are closed classes, about 20 to 30, but now he's saying that nouns have a subset that's a closed class. Okay. Well, one thing about the closed classes of say I or D, or if you want to subdivide them into universal and existential quantifiers or whatever. One thing about those closed classes of grammatical morphemes is they have a property called unique syntactic behavior. I think if you Google for that in the web, you'll find my name probably, uh, because I don't think other people have focused on it enough. But unique syntactic behavior means that any two determiners have a different syntax. And any two modals have a different syntax. Okay? A lot of people say naysayers about, uh, uh, am I, it's almost done, two minutes? No. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, people have said, oh, you know, not all the modals are the same. Language is just filled with irregularity. Okay? I mean, that's a theme of, for example, somebody who has contributed a lot to the field, and you probably know his name, Rodney Huddleston, you know, but uh, there are, you know, every, there's just irregularities of different amounts and all, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, no. Uh, unique syntactic behavior is something that says that any, not that there's some irregularities among the modals, but the, I, for any two modals, I can find a real syntactic difference will he dare visit his parents? Okay? But you cannot say, will he need visit his parents? So those dare and need and negative polarity of modals differ in another construction. They all differ pairwise. Okay? All the grading adverbs differ one from another. All the determiners differ. Okay? You can flow each, but you can't flow every. They will, they will each come on time. They will every come on time, ungrammatical. Okay. So you can try that in some language that you know. You can't find any two grammatical items that have the same grammatical behavior. That means they differ by a syntactic feature. Now, is there any need to say they differ by some other feature? No. Each and every certainly have a different interpretation. Okay. We don't know exactly what it is, but a lot of syntacticians are saying, well, there's something different about every boy. girl and each boy needs a girl. And what is it? Well, you see, actually, every is kind of like this group, but each is kind of like this different kind of group. Okay, that's some answers. <laughs> okay, uh, but each and every has a different meaning, but they also have a different syntax. I just said that every can't float, and each can, along with all and both. Okay, so they must differ by a syntactic feature, because that's what syntactic features are. Chomsky said it, I hate to mention something. 
such an old guy, but he said it four times in four different places, which, and I know where they are, in syntactic structures. A syntactic feature is one that's used in syntactic rules. And if it's not used in syntactic few rules, like the difference between, say, persuade and convince, it's not a syntactic feature. Okay, uh, makes sense. Okay, so in fact, if, if every two grammatical formatives or morphemes differs in uh, a syntactic feature, it'll have a different distribution. That means it'll have unique syntactic behavior. Okay, oh, how weird. Every two chemical elements in the periodic table have different chemical behavior. That's true, actually, right? If you said, uh, if somebody said, well, actually, uh, one kind of hydrogen and the other kind of hydrogen, they have exactly the same, same syntactic uh, behavior with respect to combinations. That's true, and they're both called hydrogen. Okay, heavy hydrogen, ordinary. Okay, so any two, uh, any two chemical elements with different valence properties and orbit properties have unique chemical behavior. And any two syntactic elements in one of these syntactic or grammatical categories has different, uh, different behavior. So it's not surprising, they're not exceptions or anything. It's just that the fact that they have different uh, syntactic features. Now, do we need to say that each and every have a different semantic feature too? No, we don't. Why should we? Because we've got, a, we've got some feature that differentiates each and every with respect to their floating and with respect to their distribution and syntax. So we've got some feature, call it F. Okay, now, do you know for sure because of your complete grasp of semantic theory, the full semantic theory that all the sem semantic formalists know about, do you know that that feature that differentiates the syntax of each and every cannot be used to describe the different semantics of each and every? Well, actually, you don't know. Because, actually, you don't actually know this full semantic theory that everybody has about natural language because, actually, nobody has it. Okay? So it seems to me that, yes, each and every differs syntactically by some feature. Okay? Call it F. And whatever differences formal semantics people or pragmatic people find in each and every, we can say it in terms of that F. Until somebody comes along with some much more beautiful and encompassing theory, which nobody seems close to to me. So now we have a, a hallmark, okay? It's like a, it's like a brand. How do we know something's a grammatical morpheme as opposed to a lexical open glass item? Unique syntactic behavior. Now look at those nouns in, uh, or let's say, verbs in six. Well, I happen to know, I mentioned 30 years of research. Um, I happen to know that all those verbs, pairwise, have a different, uh, different uh, syntactic behavior. That means co-occurrence. Bring and take have this relationship with uh, an object. They're both dictates, so or go and come, but it's a different relationship. So bring and take mean the same thing except for this Dykes' feature, like what's the goal to come. Okay, so they differ from each other. And of course it's going to be different than any, any two you pick. Do and go, or, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, I told you the difference between need and dare. Okay, so they all have this unique syntactic behavior. These subsets of open class items. Okay, so, uh, well, you can see then that there's going to be, I don't know how many grammatical categories we're going to end up counting, but we're going to have D and uh, I and uh, numerals and uh, degree or adjectival modifiers, that's four, and we're going to have nouns, verbs, adjectives, and prepositions. We're going to have grammatical subsets, that's eight. Okay, just a second. So, I don't know, and eight times, say, 25, maybe we haven't discovered some, eight times 30, 240. Okay, there's going to be conjunctions and, and the, negative, the negative not and n apostrophe t and, and even and only and, and uh, some other focus particles that we haven't discussed yet. And, uh, you know, whatever. Okay, so some agreement morphemes. And, you know, maybe we'll get up to 300. Maybe we'll get up to uh, maybe we'll get up to 400. Who knows? Okay, four to five hundred grammatical items. Each pairwise the same. 
And that's what I call the grammatical white stone. And what's, now how many, how many morphemes does a native speaker uh, control? Well, uh, Jesperson said in the early 1900s on literate Swedish speakers, it didn't mean educated people who read farming magazines and stuff. Uh, in 1905, Jesperson said not only did Shakespeare have 20,000 morphemes, Swedish farmers do too. Okay, and then I talked in Japan to some grammatical uh, computational people, and they said they think that the average native speakers uh, control about 35,000 morphemes. And some people said more. So then I made some tests with the students at the University of Durham, where I was teaching at the time, and said, go to a dictionary, it's like 400 pages long, of your native language, and pick out on any two pages, just roughly speaking, how many morphemes uh, you know, different morphemes, you know, not the same prefix 10 times in a row, uh, and multiply by the number of pages. So all those German students, who I used to give Ds to and stuff like that, they all got about 25 or 30,000 as an estimate, and mine was, for myself was only 20,000, but anyway, maybe I was more strict. Anyway, so let's say 20,000 is a minimum. Okay, and now we got like 400 grammatical morphemes. So what are the rest? What are the 19,600 others? Well, they're all in the categories N, A, B, and P, and uh, that's what people are calling roots. And they differ by features because they all mean something different. With, you know, some pathological exceptions like oculus and eye, eye doctor, maybe. But I mean, they all mean something different. So we got, uh, shall we say, 19,600 morphemes there. Um, that are, do not have distinct syntactic features, and they're all in four categories. The majority are nouns, but still, there's thousands of adjectives and verbs. And Hank Van Rainstick once counted 350 Dutch adjectives, including things like in case or because of, and things like that. Okay, so uh, so these things have come to be called roots for other reasons than what I just gave, but. Uh, this reason as good as any, uh, and I'm sure Jeff will talk more about that next week. Okay. Some, Maybe we'll um, talk about it, so I don't need to address it now. But I was wondering when you have, say, for example, perception verbs like see, hear, and maybe smell, I don't know. Well, they're in the list, and smell is not a grammatical verb, and see and hear are. Uh, how do you see and hear? Hmm? How do you see and hear differ? Well, first of all, I think. This is an empirical study, right? So I don't just say these properties. This is not deduced from my, and I don't think that's how science advances, by clever people sitting and you know, thinking about how, how should linguistic theory look. When I see uh, properties that uh, a very small set of what seem to be grammaticalized elements uh, share, I take it as an empirical generalization to state the property, and then to figure out uh, to design a model and then figure out how in that model or modifying that model those properties could come out. And one of the things that is very rare in English, as people ought to know, is bare infinitives. Okay? And modals, of course, are followed by a bare infinitive. But uh, what verbs are followed by a bare infinitive? Well, basically, in each with their own version of it, uh, um, Uh, the English verbs that take bare infinitives, they're always, uh, bare infinitives are always complements and they're adjectives, adjuncts, they're never modifiers of nouns uh, or adjectives, okay. And the bare infinitive verbs in English are make, let, have, see, hear, watch. I don't think you can say observe, but some people have thought you can. So, uh, John will observe Mary, bake the cake. I don't think that's grammatical. But, uh, John will watch Mary bake the cake. He is grammatical. Uh, what's the difference between see, hear, and watch? Okay. Uh, uh, watch, I think I can say. Yeah, I, John, John was watched to, John was, John watched Mary bake the cake. John, uh, Mary was watched to bake a cake. 
that's completely out. Mary was seen to bake a cake. Mary was heard to bury a cake. So watch the cake. Okay. So now we got to get the difference between see and hear. Uh, of course, I think there's a lot of cross linguistic stuff here going on. So it doesn't bother me since the only other language I'm sure exists is French. Because uh, that's the one I know. Certainly, there's a difference between see and hear in French because you get these voila, voici constructions in French with see but not with hear. So, uh, but. Uh, yeah, so I mean, in general, the question. Of course, the claim is that there's a syntactic feature that differs from it. That doesn't mean that every language that uses that syntactic feature has to have a rule that is sensitive to it. It doesn't absolutely mean that. But given, I mean, I could easily wiggle out of many things saying that, so I don't want to. Mm. Yeah, so the thanks, I mean, that was exactly what I was wondering. So, I mean, I couldn't find any syntactic difference between, say, see and hear. See and hear in Czech, and so I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in English. And at the same time, I also think that they're grammatical, so I was just wondering. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, let's bring that as. Thanks for being Okay, so now let's. Uh, before you go on, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, also, um, just about. Uh, Preposition of so peace. Yeah, so I'm just curious uh, what the arguments are for including it, uh, including it as a root versus a grammatical morpheme. Uh, uh, especially, I mean, I sometimes talk about this uh, with the students in morphology. Well, there's definitely a group because of it's a, uh, because prepositions are. Prepositions are a closed class. Well, the ones so. that the ones that are grammatical prepositions are a closed class, and I expect between twenty and thirty of them. Okay, just like I do for nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Okay, I mean that's for and with and uh, and uh, by and in and uh, on. I expect those are grammatical prepositions, exactly like grammatical verbs and nouns. Okay. okay. Then the other ones are these things like uh, despite, in spite of. Uh, I don't know, uh, alongside, uh, uh, downstairs, uh, down, down, you know, and of course there's a lot of interesting prepositions in this framework that I'm citing of myself and Grand Rings and other people. So downtown is an intransitive preposition. And those are open class. I have a little speculation that, um, why this class shouldn't have, say, a thousand members, okay? Uh, and it's at the back of the, actually, the, um, this paper I wrote in the 80s called uh, um, uh, Parts of Speech and Generative Grammar. And it's that uh, we all have this innate uh, space-time grid for what's going on in the world around us as far as that goes, so to the higher animals or some animals. And um, the prepositions, the category P, locates things on the space-time grid. Whereas nouns, adjectives, and verbs pick out aspects of the space-time grid. I mean, the, the three, three categories have to be different. And there's a lot more things on the space-time grid that we operate with that are on it and therefore situated on it, then there are actual ways to locate or point out the, what do you call it, in the GPS, the coordinates on the space-time grid. So the P's are coordinates on the space-time grid. It's also a grid of reasoning, uh, if and because and whatever. There's a lot more, there aren't as many things for uh, locating that, so there, it's a much smaller class. But yeah, this is a, uh, I mean, this is a question that I'm not worried about being able to divide off a set of and find some properties in between grammatical prepositions and a more open class version. Um, there is a completely, I think, impossible to find probably. There was a PhD student at Durham, Seiki Ayano, who wrote about big P and little p. A lot of his work is, you know, well, his work isn't derivative, but. Uh, his work was, a lot of it was derivative and from Van Rienstick's work. But, uh, I mean, he, and he talked about them in Japanese too. But anyway, uh, of course I, I agree that, you know, it's, it's not, 
prima facie obvious why that should be. You have to at least talk about it. Okay. Um, so let's So, um, uh, that's on the next page, actually, that two, where the uh, page two, uh, example nine. These are P's in 9A and B that, you know, maybe people don't think of as the typical list of P's that first come to mind. But they're the kind of things that Van Riemsdyk said he found 350 of. I saw his list, but I didn't memorize his list of Dutch propositions. Uh, so anyway, that there were things like that. Okay. And of course, he's taking for granted, which is not so obvious in Czech grammar, but nonetheless, I mean, uh, that uh, these intransitive things that appear in prepositional phrase with prepositional phrase distribution, like he put the books upstairs. He put the books aboard, put should take a prepositional phrase, right? And then he put the books away. I'm taking for granted that these things are P's without an object. Some so them, that gives you quite a few. Some of them can take an object. Yeah, some of them can, right? Like uh, side. Right. Alongside, alongside the alongside the wall. Right. Okay. So the next thing I do, which I think, given you know, the limited amount of time we have, is talk about the difference between these grammatical features, which make grammatical morphemes in different classes pairwise distinct, and the semantic features. Okay? You can see that something in 13, that these are features that have to do with the distribution, what traditional people would call syntactic. Right? Uh, if, you can, if it's not a traditional, Grammar would say probably something like very old is grammatical, but uh, very dead is just some kind of funny metaphorical use and it's not really grammatical. Okay, and then people have noted for stative verbs that even if you use them with some verbs called stative, that both the progressives and the imperative sound uh, a bit forced or you know only good in certain circumstances, whereas with an activity verb, they all sound basically fine. So in 13, you have some big F grammatical features. And so hence, there are things like verbs that differ. Uh, for example, be and have, or most uses of have, are stative. But go and do and make are not stative. So they differ by that grammatical feature, okay, and so, and so on. Um, so that's summarizing 14. And uh, I made up this word once just to entertain myself, syntacticon. Uh, but other people like Jamal Mohalla have used the word grammatical lexicon, which is okay with me, uh, for the uh, things that are not roots. <clears throat> so now I'm uh, sort of stuck with this problem of do we want to talk about some of the empirical paradigms that push me into this direction and probably not say much more about the, the theoretical way things are organized in this model of the lexicon. Or do we want to talk about the theoretical organization and tread lightly on the actual empirical paradigms that led me to this position? The handout, the other handout is about the empirical material. And the rest of this handout, pages uh, three and four, are about some generalizations and possibly their, and the way they fit in, the way the sort of model of lexical insertion that I propose, or that I propose, uh, handles these generalizations or tries to predict them or at least make them easy to state. So I don't know what to do. So I think I'll have a vote among those 
that don't have a PhD. Should we go to the empirical part on the other handout about these different nominalizations with ing and not worry too much about how, at least, you know, until you go home and study it, how the different levels of insertion actually uh, fit into this model of making uh, syntactic derivations? Or should we go concentrate on the model of syntactic derivations and, uh, you know, you'll study on your own, or at least I won't be able to do much more than just sort of indicate uh, what you should study to see how it, the model is kind of more empirically confirmed. So it's sort of a discussion of the empirical data or discussion of the theoretical model. People without a PhD can vote. Empirical model? The model. Hmm? The model. Um, empirical data. Or the model. The model. So the model. If everyone agrees. Does everybody agree with the guy that told you what to think? <laughs> well, does somebody disagree? Mm -hmm. the theory. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, well, okay. The If we refer to the empirical thing at all, what we're going to refer to, besides the trees that got shaded pictures on them, are the, the generalizations in the squares. On page one, result nominals. On page three, event nominals, squares with bold type and size. And on page On page six, the gerund, gerund nominals. All these nominals, at least one of their forms, is a verb root with ing making something nominal. That's what they all have in common. Okay. And yet there's some very clearly distinguishable types, subtypes, that very well-known and well-respected linguists have clarified since 1970. I think traditional grammar wasn't straight on these differences at all. Uh, you know, oh well, English does this, and sometimes with certain verbs it does this, and it gets a little bit more that way, and blah blah blah. But I think starting from about 1970, you got some clear distinctions. One big step forward was a study by Jane Grimshaw in 1990 or 91. I always forget the year. Um, so, but we're only going to refer to this in passing. Okay. But I emphasize that this model was not, I have not thought it up because I like the way it looks and it satisfies my theoretical proclivities or preferences for how models should be designed or that I think it's elegant. I mean, I don't think it's inelegant. But the way to design the model is so that the empirical generalizations can be saved, which I think has got to be the design of any. So um, there's even a couple of things that are not really justified in anything in either of the handouts. There's something you know called phases, which sort of mean domains that for some purposes maybe all for one or more reasons we want to somehow call these domains complete. Uh, in they, appear, they appear inside of bigger sentences or they can, where they, you know, a sentence can have only one of these domains and they're called in the, in, in the, uh, in the idiom of uh, minimalism, they're called phases. So let's call these phasal domains, okay? And uh, phasal domains uh, can be inside of other phasal domains at any given point, okay? And uh, let's call this phasal domain one inside of phasal domain two. That's down there in the picture. Uh, think, you can think of them as like big noun phrases or DPs or clauses or CPs. You know, which is the best design of, you know, uh, 
which node should qualify as phases depends on the empirical generalizations that you can express uh, in these uh, in a given theoretical choice. So let's say that there's uh, one thing about label brackets is that I don't have to say too clearly, you know, how many intermediate nodes there are. Okay, but anyway, there's some kind of the outside brackets represent some kind of area, and then there can be stuff in here, or there can be no. And the idea is that as you're building a syntactic tree from bottom up, uh, inserting items as you go along, uh, when you get to a new important domain or phasal domain, you insert, you insert another head, okay, from either the dictionary or the syntacticon, okay, which you could call more generally the lexicon or the vocabulary storage if you want, the place where you have all those 20,000 or 30,000 morphemes in your head, in your in the native speakers, or even the very good foreign speakers vocabulary. Okay. Uh, so at any given point, uh, you're going to have this double, this configuration of embedding. Now, of course, if you're just starting out at the very bottom of a tree, this won't be here, but that just means that, you know, anything that applies to it or is true of it is just vacuously true. And of course, when you get done, uh, it might be that this is the top or root of the tree and there's no further space to go to, okay? But in any typical situation, you have these, you know, one phasal domain within another for all the stuff that you want to talk about, like successive cyclic movement or, you know, I don't know, uh, noun phrases embedded, noun phrases inside sentences, you know, extended DPs inside clauses and stuff like that. So you have this basic situation and you want to know sort of like how the syntactic model, including the insertion from the vocabulary storage, uh, which includes the, mor mor the grammatical morphemes and the roots, uh, how, uh, how these things proceed. Remember, uh, the, the, uh, the syntacticon, or the grammatical lexicon, uh, contains these uh, sets of syntactic features, so syntactic F, and they contain some spelling, okay? And that's all. There's no, there's no semantics, okay? Uh, any semantics is to be read off interpretively from the trees that are constructed with these because these syntactic features are supposedly, from what I said, enough to construct the meaning or the interpretation. Okay, so these, these also, by the way, include, uh, in which people think of, they don't think of this right away, but they include, they include uh, contextual features. So you take something like, you know, take a word like of. Okay, there's your spelling. It doesn't have to be on the left necessarily. Well, of is a preposition. And interestingly, love, uh, of love, of doesn't have, uh, probably the first person I've ever said of or love, but anyway. Um, anyway, uh, of is missing in English, interestingly, any kind of locational feature of space or time, which is typical of prepositions, right? Except maybe it's some idiom or something like that. Uh, but in fact, of is used in places where uh, space-time location is not part of the meaning, okay? So you actually, my version of this, which is not maybe totally central to this, but I, I, I think that these syntactic features, as you just saw, play an important part in semantics. The semantics that we don't yet understand, or that we certainly don't fully understand. Okay, so I think, of course, and this is in a lot of the works that I write, I mean, P and location, uh, P in syntax and location in space-time, in semantics, it's the same thing, okay? But of precisely doesn't have this interpretation. So I have to say that there is something special about of that it's like uh, defective preposition in the, in the semantically defective preposition, okay? Just like the verb be, all verbs are basically activities, 
Okay, I don't think you need a separate feature activity and B. You just need V. But now what about the word B, which is not an activity? Well, you have to say it's a V because it has a B, not, not is or are, but B. Okay, you have to say it's a verb. Okay, but you don't say, but you have to say that it doesn't have this activity interpretation. So you have to have some way to say, don't use this syntactic feature in LF in the usual way. Okay, I actually use this feature. Okay, why not? This means when you get to LF, this won't mean location. Okay? Another thing that of won't mean is uh, that because there can be non-locational things for like uh, interpretations as a source and goal, uh, there can be a goal and a source feature, so it doesn't, of doesn't generally mean anything that has to do with goal. And of course, it has very importantly, uh, it has a contextual feature, which I guess you could say DP, or uh, this means a D-headed, a D-headed maximal phrase. Okay, so when I say grammatical morphine in the, this um, grammatical lexicon, I mean something like that. Okay? And of course, there's sub-hypotheses, right? 30 years, 30 years, my salary for 30 years. I had to do something, right? So, in fact, I dreamed up these things. And there's a lot of these lexical entries, uh, less maybe sophisticated than uh, what I would think of just today in my 2000 book and the, the end of the book. Okay, so the grammatical lexicon just looks like the, these. But like the root lexicon, if you want to call it that, uh, and I'm just happy to, uh, well, maybe the word root, root vocabulary storage or whatever, root storage, sounds like a country cottage where you're keeping the, I don't know, the beets and the, and the potatoes over the winter. Um, okay, so root storage. Well, they have some syntactic features too. Now, of course, some people might want to say, well, they don't have any syntactic features, but somehow, I mean, there are roots that are connected with, say, only adjectives like clever and whatever. Uh, so, uh, you, there has to be some way, they might be context features, okay? Saying that, uh, to say that clever is an adjective might mean to say, that it appears in the context of a grammatical, say, A category. Okay, so it has, it has context features of various sorts. So, um, of course there's some spelling. That how do you figure out, but there's also this uh, conceptual, psychological uh, configuration which I think Michal Starka calls mush. Uh, and Jack and Doff talks about dogs as being gray and not in black and white and they have legs and I don't know what in our conceptual strategy, right? So how are we gonna put these into a tree? A tree is supposed to be a formal object. Well, in fact, um, we have to figure out a spelling for these root, roots that are stored and gonna be used in trees and I think there's quite important, uh, uh, this is an area um, not always discussed, disagreement with Jeff, but I found a passage that I like, so I'll share it with you. John, uh, I tried to do this in a way I could easily get a hold of what I'm doing, but I guess I failed. Let's turn to the back page of this, page four. You don't have to turn, but you bottom of page four. Um, Chomsky and Halley in Sound Pattern of English were discussing, you know, what, what is the, uh, I mean, in this kind of dissociarian notion that you have a meaning connected with a spelling or a phonological form, meaning and form, uh, they said, well, what should be the spelling? Because, of course, in the eyes of a lot of empiricists, phonetics people, it should be somehow a phonetics matrix. And Chomsky and Halley, like a lot of formal generativists, would say no. I mean, that's, you know, that's not really an abstract representation. We don't need a lot of phonetic detail in the lexical representations. Uh, they said we need a kind of abstract uh, location in the lexicon 
for where to find for where to find out how to pronounce a, a certain bunch of mush. This is a dog or the meaning of persuade or something like that. Okay? And they propose that that's actually what the abstract phonological features are, the underspecified minimal uh, grammatical or uh, uh, phonological representation. Okay, so their notion was something like if you want to take the difference between, say, um, uh, say, uh, uh, say pig and big, okay, you don't need you don't need to say p for pig and b for big in this spelling. Uh, you need to say the one that is marked only, which would be big voiced, because unvoiced p, if you have a consonant at the beginning of a word, it's probably even true that the unvoiced consonant at the beginning of words uh, throughout the lexicon is probably P. So basically, there's not very much you need to say for pig. I mean, you have to say it has a final consonant, and uh, maybe you have to say, I, I don't know how much, you probably have to say the vowel isn't ah, but their notion is that you just put down in the spelling the uh, minimal phonologically uh, unspecified matrices that allow you to differentiate this, the, this piece of mush from everything else you talk about. So I think that actually I was impressed by this at a certain younger age and I think that that isn't a bad idea and if you want to call this a sort of like if you want to say the index in vocabulary storage or root storage, the index tells you where to find the pronunciation of, uh, uh, of, a, of a concept that you want to put in a tree, but concepts don't fit in trees because they have this psychological structure and God knows what it is. If you want to find out how to use it in a tree, you have to find an index that says pronounce something, and that something that you're going to pronounce, the index, is minimally specified by this uh, phonologically unspecified spelling. That's what that last part four talks about. Um, and uh, that's you know, my interpretation of uh, Tomsky and Halley. Uh, and uh, well, I think it's, it's, a reasonable, it's a reasonable idea. So um, you, you do need to, this vocabulary or root storage has things in it that cannot be used in the syntax. I mean, the syntax just can't recognize these at all because the, the structure of this mush, uh, let's call it, uh, I don't know, uh, underspecified spelling, underspecified uh, phonological matrix. Okay, that's like an index. Uh, I mean, it plays a role in index. It tells you. Uh, where to find the spelling for these syntactic features. Uh, and these tell you where to put where to put the spelling. And this tells you, or tells the speaker in the here what they're talking about. And this is in their lexicons. But in fact, uh, you could say it's associated with the grammatical items or something, but there's no reason to say that, you know, there's anything except a kind of a lexical lookup uh, for this, uh, say, indexed set of pieces of mush, okay? meaning mush by start, I think, means is not amenable to any kind of syntactic uh, manipulation or it's not part of the same system or whatever. Okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, I'd like to point out, you know, because I think sometimes I don't know, I guess I would say the, the image that people often have, uh, including, you know, well-known linguists and whatever, of syntax and semantics is that, oh, all this meaning is all connected in this semantic system. And then there's some, like, there's this, like, purely syntactic stuff because, you know, there's funny things that aren't connected directly to syntax, like, you know, I don't know, a, a dative case in check or something like that. Uh, or some kind of aspect of morphine. And that's like extra stuff, that's syntax. But all the real stuff is semantic. Well, I'm afraid I have this image, which I think I'm, I actually share with Professor Chomsky. Uh, and 
which is that no, the real stuff is syntax. That's the stuff A, we have clear evidence for, well form in this and whatever. The real stuff is syntax. The center core of meaning is syntax. Uh, the meanings that we can express. I mean, the Russian psychologist Vygotsky pointed out that, you know, we cannot, uh, no matter, I cannot describe to you my cousin's face, that you're, if you're going to go to the railroad station and, and meet my cousin, and I don't say he's going to have a red shirt on or something like that, but I just say, well, his face is kind of long and narrow, and he has this kind of angular nose, and, well, his complexion is dark, but not too dark, and there's a few freckles. Well, I mean, okay, you go to the central station, you go to King's Cross in London and say, oh, that's the cousin I recognize perfectly because of the way you describe the bone structure underneath the eyes. No, Vygotsky said, uh, you know, there's certain things that we cannot put in language. For example, as much as we can remember faces, maybe hundreds or thousands of them, we can't describe them to our best friends in a way that they can use language to go meet somebody at the railroad station. Okay? So uh, there's certain things that we just can't say, but the meanings that we can say are uh, the meanings that are interpreted from the bundles of syntactic features by these closed class items, the, the I's and the D's and the grading adjectives and the grammatical verbs and the grammatical adjectives the numerals and whatever. Those are the things we can say, and that we can, you know, uh, get across to our, uh, to our friend. Uh, one thing at the railroad station when you meet my cousin, he always wears an odd number of rings on his fingers. So you have to look for somebody who has one, three, five, seven, or nine rings on their fingers. Oh, well that actually should help, okay? Uh, of course, a lot of people wear one ring, but at least you got rid of all the people that have no ring or two rings. Okay? But, uh, so there are some things that we can say with language and other things that we can't say. Um, <clears throat> other people have said that, you know, we cannot really describe, when we describe case, we're almost always, with very few exceptions, we're describing, uh, we're uh, describing uh, case like. So the things that we can say. So I think that the point is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of syntactic features. Uh, they are the central core of semantics. They fit together in these trees that are put together according to the things like uh, insertion conditions, well formedness conditions, whatever. Uh, and you can say some things that are quite complex without any of these uh, 19,600 roots. Uh, like in 22, those things are all grammatical morphemes. So there's no roots in that, uh, in those sentences. So you don't need any. And the syntactic structure has got all the features that are needed for interpretation for both of those. Okay. So I don't think that's quite what many people, you know, think have in mind, even if they are sympathetic to this kind of perspective. Uh, but it is, a com it is a consequence of my claims. So now let's go back to uh, page uh, three, which again, you don't have to turn. But I will. So um, this is going back to the um, uh, thing I said about uh, you know, did, did, did I design this model because I like it, uh, you know, I like the way the picture looks, or I think that, I don't know, by some kind of analogy to things about science, I think it's a good model. No. Thank you for that. Um, um, rather, I started out basically in the late 80s, uh, quite interested in, for some other reasons, of dividing uh, the, the, what were then called open class or grammatic or lexical head categories from the grammatical categories. And of course, these divisions into closed and open classes go back, you know, to 
traditional or structuralist grammar, but without people saying that there's a clear division between them. And I started to think of properties that seemed to me, uh, this is a little bit along the lines of Pavel's you know, property about those infinitives, I started to think of empirical properties that divided uh, grammatical morphine grammatical morphine classes from uh, 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 open class items, or you could call them roots, okay? And it is true that these roots are not connected so directly to even the categories NADP. I mean, I picked out a couple of favorite examples where they seem to be, have a closer connection with the word clever. But of course, there are many, many situations where there, there are some restrictions, but uh, the connection between these lexical head categories, which play a central role in syntax, and the actual words that fill them out um, are you know, somehow not one to one, that's for sure. Okay, or not even close. Okay. So uh, the categories, these are basically in this 2000 book, and they're kind of rearranged in an article I wrote later in 2015. Uh, which was a response to a review of the book, basically a positive review, but one that you know, somehow didn't say everything you know, I wanted the reviewer to say it to them. Uh, so uh, let me go through these and say, you know, which things are uh, kind of the consequences and which things are actually things I have to stipulate. Okay. Well, I think the first line is. Uh, that we've been talking about that a lot, and so there's not too much more that I haven't said already that I can say right now. Um, and I have a watch. Uh, five, it's uh, 328. 328. I have 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Good to know. Um, so, uh, one thing that I haven't talked about, and I think this is another characteristic that's connected to unique syntactic behavior, uh, if you look at, if you just go back maybe and look at the open, the closed class of verbs, okay, that was back in, uh, which number was that? Uh, the closed class of verbs was on, uh, it was number six, okay? There's another property of that closed class of verbs. These are the verbs, and these are the only verbs that appear in positions that you don't think of as typical heads of verb phrases. Okay. Um, for example, maybe an infinitive has to have a two in English. And it's only uh, those, um, only those verbs that appear in a position where you can have a bare infinitive complement, a subset of those verbs, okay? Each different, of course, because they're grammatical words, okay? If you're looking for the, what people call the auxiliaries in a language, there's no such thing as a class of auxiliaries across languages. There's a, a book written about in the early 80s by Susan Steele called Encyclopedia of Aux, Auxiliaries. And she was not much of a Chomskyan at all, but she, she, I don't know, she's celebrated, uh, you know, irregularities and differences and stuff. But what things are called auxiliaries in languages? Well, actually, it's different in every, different in every language. Okay? Uh, so, uh, the, um, for example, the Spanish for tener, meaning have in present day Spanish, doesn't have any auxiliary uses. Okay, uh, there's of course an idiom, but that's an ah, but uh, that's an idiom isn't the same thing as being an auxiliary. Okay, uh, so uh, if you think of something like, uh, what, how do people describe this English construction with a bare infinitive with no agreement allowed? Like John, uh, my my brothers go help go visit my parents every weekend. Okay, but you cannot say my brother goes visit my parents. And what is that go visit? You know, go, some kind of auxiliary. 
that there can't be any agreement, and it's only true of go and come. Okay? Is it a purpose clause? But there's no two way. You can maybe say go to visit my parents, but you can't say my my brothers travel visit my parents. No, that's excluded. Okay. Uh, so go and come. Different art authors have written about this. One of them is called Arthur Spears. Uh, go and come have this uh, special uh, uh, grammatical use in English. So uh, the point about back on the table now. Uh, uh, some of these sometimes well these verbs have irregular or special or item particular grammatical positions and uh, sometimes the uh, features that they spell out for example in their morphology um, are not necessarily in the position where you'd expect those features to be uh, spelled out so, for example, when you have feminine gender on an adjective, well, people have pointed out a thousand times that, uh, you know, well, if, you know, to say something like uh, big or, or, I don't know, I don't know, uh, uh, smart or you know, young, well, there's not, I mean, young isn't, young feminine isn't semantically different than young masculine, okay? So, uh, these, uh, when you have agreement features, like on something like ad ad these adjectives, uh, they, uh, they sometimes spell out PF features that are not where, the not where those features are interpreted in logical form. I mean, I suppose young is interpreted as a modifier directly of a noun, okay? And masculine uh, or feminine would be the same. So, um, in order to see this late insertion, you'd have to look more at that other hand up. Okay. So, um, uh, now the, the uh, grammatical items have this, what you might call, old time Germanic stress. There's a few prefixes that are uh, exempt from it, uh, like, for example, in even something like before, uh, but uh, in certain verbs too, but basically the old Germanic stress is initial syllable stress, and the grammatical items have that, but the open class items, the roots, uh, far from conforming to that, right, in spite of some dopey things that undergraduates at Pulaski sometimes say about nouns have initial stress in English. Subjunctive in English, or no more 
which Jesperson said in the 1920s. Okay, there is no subjunctive here. There's just a missing motive. I demand that she uh, should not be late. Okay, so that means there's a null motive. And there's other things that are null, like agreement in English, in, other than third singular, it might be a null morph. But in spite of the fact that even some linguists, of course, has argued that there's open class items that are null, but I, in the article I cited from 2015, I tried to show that it's fanciful. Uh, there aren't any open class null morphemes. Uh, so, uh, the, that doesn't mean lexical category, right? I said open class. So, um, the next page, or the page four, um, the, it's the grammatical features, small f, that have uh, connection with our psychology and our culture and our memory. Um, the, uh, it has these NAV and possibly P have these large numbers of uh, members, but even if P doesn't, for some other, for some grammatical reason, it's still a one-way implication that the open classes uh, have to be among NAVP, okay? Um, so, um, the purely semantic F never occur, I mean, in derivations, like you can have a passive or a WH question, only if the main verb has, I don't know, some semantic feature, okay? Uh, so, um, You'd have to read my paper about uh, lexical lookup to get that number 10. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about full suppletion, but at least in English, I, I don't have a theoretical reason why it should never be allowed, but at least in English and French, uh, the only place you get full suppletion are different initial consonants. In this, other words, otherwise semantically or synonymous words. The only place you get these, this full suppletion is in closed class items. So in the next little table, it's the place is where the empirical points in the above table uh, fit into the theoretical model. Okay? So, um, how much time do I have? Two minutes? We have eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So, <clears throat> okay. So, um, the um, account of one, okay, <clears throat> well, my claim is that you have all, that human language is this kind of syntactic skeleton that uh, comes from some early class of primates, uh, actually, I wrote an article about this too, but uh, some early class of primates figured out how to uh, sign or say, maybe earlier sign, uh, these certain conceptual, certain uh, concepts that they had, like, for example, a number, an animate, and uh, demonstrative, and uh, uh, past and present, okay, and good and bad, okay, uh, and uh, very, I mean extremely, okay, they had certain concepts and somehow or another they figured out a way to sign them in combination, okay, but the trouble is they couldn't talk about much, okay, I mean they, they could tell the difference between dogs and lions and elephants and monkeys and snakes and whatever. But uh, this system of uh, grammatical features, uh, the combinatorial system, didn't have any way for them to use this nice communication system for basic, uh, I don't know, connect things of direction and location and good and bad and past and present. Uh, and counting, it didn't have any way to fit in all these many things that they could talk about, okay, and all the many things they could do. 
like jump, hunt, hide, uh, I don't know, devour, hit, uh, uh, kill, uh, plant. Uh, so they needed to extend, ex they needed to. So does my dog need to, but my dog doesn't know how to do it. Okay, so they somehow were able to expand uh, the, this communicative system based on grammatical morphemes or assigning grammatical concepts uh, to a sort of open class of activities and properties, like all the different colors uh, and sizes, okay? They needed to extend this class of, gr of grammatical, uh, shall we say, messages so that an open class of properties and things and activities could be included in these messages. And so they had to figure out places they could put these. And they figured out three places they could put the things on the space-time grid. Namely, uh, they could put them in the N position, the V position, and the A position. And maybe they could name places on the space-time grid in a more complex way. Or maybe that was later, who knows. Um, that would be P. Okay, so uh, the idea is that uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the roots uh, were uh, accessible by some kind of index. These open class concepts were accessible by some kind of index. And then you could put them in certain places in the tree, and then you could manipulate the tree. But actually, you couldn't do the tree manipulation, couldn't do anything except just keep the index in the same, the, the same index uh, for, the, um, for the same open class concept. So the idea is that this beginning of this bottom-up procedure uh, has uh, connections between the roots and positions in that tree. But that's the last time that the tree can see or do anything with the roots. Uh, and that's why you have this uh, property in one, okay? Uh, I don't think I said that very clearly, but maybe I'm getting tired, okay? Um, I don't think I, there's no real time to talk here about alternative realization you can, uh, or dissociation. You can look at the handout maybe. But and the, thir the third one, I think, I just basically have said. There were so many concepts, actions, things, and uh, people, and uh, properties that could somehow, that needed a, uh, uh, an index or a uh, kind of a sort of a categorical, not categorical, or kind of a, uh, well, a specification of how to pronounce them, that the simplest way to pronounce, the simplest phonological system, was uh, surpassed in many languages, well, in many languages, I'm not sure that all languages have this kind of secondary pronunciation system for you know, advanced vocabulary, but many languages do, okay? Um, so uh, then the, um, that's the third 